my dear students and viewers in the previous lecture we were discussing the ideas of partial derivative directional derivative and differentiability for functions of several variables we have also got to know a hierarchy of these three concepts we got to know that the differentiability implies the existence of directional derivatives along every possible direction and existence of directional derivatives implies existence of partial derivatives now in this lecture we will use the ideas of differentiability and partial derivatives to approximate a function in terms of a quadratic polynomial or in terms of a linear function and to find such approximations of a function of several variables we will use the idea of taylor's theorem for a function of several variables in writing taylor's approximation of a function of several variables we will get to know two particular asymptotic notations those are small o and big o notations neatly the agendas of this lecture are two topics those are little o and big o notations and using these two notations we will try to write out taylor's polynomial approximation for functions of several variables let's start our discussion with the notion of big o notation and then we will get to know the idea of little o notation you know these notions of big o and little o are used to compare the growth rate of two functions around a given point we shall discuss these two notions big o and little o to compare two function values around the origin of the n dimensional euclidean space r n let we are given two functions a real valued function say g from r n to the real number set that does not vanish in a neighborhood around the origin except possibly at the origin of the space r n and suppose the other function is f which is a vector valued function defined on the r n space whose domain may be a subset of r n but this domain includes the origin of the space r n then we write f is big o of g expressed by f is equal to big o of g to mean that the ratio norm of f x divided by absolute value of g x is bounded near the origin of r n that is there exists an upper bound say capital k of this ratio in a delta neighborhood of the origin which is expressed by this inequality that norm fx divided by modulus of gx is less than equal to k for all x in the domain of definition of f with norm x is less than delta and we write f is small o of g which we pronounce as f is little o of g if the limit limit extends to 0 norm of fx divided by modulus of gx is equal to 0 intuitively this limit is equal to 0 means that the function f goes to 0 faster than the function g here i have given the notions of big o and small o for comparing the growth rate of the functions f and g around the point origin of the n dimensional euclidean space r n 
However, one can give similar definitions around any other non-null vector in the n-dimensional Euclidean space Rn. In fact, in many areas of theory of computations, these two notions are also used to compare growth rates of functions at infinity where we consider instead of x tends to 0, we take x tends to infinity or norm x tends to infinity. Moreover, this variable x that we have taken off in these two definitions is a continuous variable. By that we mean we are continuously sweeping towards origin. We can even take discrete variable like the variable n that takes off integral values and when n tends to infinity, we can consider this inequality to define big O notation and this limit as n tends to infinity to identify small o notation. As in our course, we shall require comparison of two functions around the origin of the n-dimensional Euclidean space Rn, we confine ourselves only with this inequality for big O notation and this limit for small o notation. Let me now consider a few examples on big O and little o or small o notations. For example, note that we can write a real valued variable x simply as big O of x because we have the function f as fx is equal to x and gx is equal to x and thus mod of fx divided by mod of gx is equal to 1 for any non-zero x and hence mod of fx by mod of gx is a bounded quantity in any neighborhood of x is equal to 0. However, you notice that in order to say that the function f is of big O of g, we need this inequality is true in at least one neighborhood of the point origin. Next, you notice that for a real valued variable x, x square is of big O of half x since modulus of fx which is modulus of x square divided by modulus of gx which is modulus of half of x is equal to 2 mod x which is less than equal to some constant capital K is equal to say 1 for all non-zero x with mod x is less than equal to half. So with k is equal to 1 and delta is equal to half we have this condition fulfilled and therefore x square is equal to capital O of half of x. Let us consider few more examples. A real valued variable x is not equal to big O of x square because here modulus of fx is equal to mod x divided by modulus of gx is modulus of x square is equal to for non-zero x 1 over mod x which is unbounded as x approaches to 0. For a real variable x, notice that a vector valued function having first component as x cube, second component as 2x squared plus 3x to the power 4 is of big O or capital O of x square because you notice that norm of fx is given by under root of x to the power 6 plus x to the power 4 times 2 plus 3x square whole square provided we are using the usual Euclidean norm and modulus of gx in the denominator is x square 
which for x not equal to 0 is under root of x square plus 2 plus 3x square whole square which is less than or equal to under root of 1 plus 2 2 plus 3 square when you have x square is less than equal to 1 or modulus x less than equal to 1. So with k is equal to under root of 26 and delta is equal to 1, this condition of big O notation is satisfied and hence we have this function is big O of x square. Now quickly you may please verify that sin x is big O of x and x square is of small o of x since limit x tends to 0 modulus of fx divided by modulus of gx is equal to 0. Similarly, we can write x cube as small o of x square and also x cube is small o of x. Further, we can also write that x is of small o of 1 and you also please verify that this vector valued function x cube in the first component and 2x squared plus 3x to the power 4 in the second component for a real variable x is small o of x. After giving these examples, let me also mention you from the very definitions of big O and small o that if the function f is small o of g, then f is also big O of g because f is of small o of g tells us this quantity, this ratio is bounded near the origin because this limit does exist. However, if the function f is of big O of g, not necessarily then f is of small o of g. For this, simply you take a counter example say f x is equal to x and g x is equal to 2 x. Then we notice that x is of big O of 2 x but x is not small o of 2 x. So as a note we write out that if a function f is of small o of g then the function f is of capital O of g but not conversely. I also would like to make a special note that if we have a function f that is big O of norm of x to the power p for some p greater than 0 then the function f certainly is small o of norm of x to the power p minus epsilon for any epsilon greater than 0. Here in this note we are taking up the function f as usual is a function from Rn to Rm and thus this variable x is having n many components. To realize this note we see that we are assuming the function f is of big O of norm x to the power p and hence you have norm of fx divided by norm of x to the power p bounded by some constant say k in some neighborhood of origin say we take out norm of x less than delta for some delta greater than 0 and therefore we see that norm of fx divided by norm of x to the power p minus epsilon for non-null x is equal to norm of fx divided by norm of x to the power p multiplied with norm of x to the power epsilon. As this quantity is bounded in a neighborhood of origin, we have this quantity 
tends to 0 as x tends to the null vector. And hence, this limit indicates that the function f is of small o of norm x to the power p minus epsilon for any epsilon greater than 0. Now, we shall consider to discuss Taylor's expansion for functions of several variables to approximate the function in terms of polynomials. Towards explaining Taylor's expansion or Taylor's theorem for functions of several variables, at first let us recall the Taylor's theorem for functions of one variable. With the help of Taylor's theorem for functions of one variable, we shall thereafter consider Taylor's theorem for functions of several variables. We recall that Taylor's theorem for functions of one variable states that if the function f is m times continuously differentiable on a closed and bounded interval say a to b, then for any x inside open A closed B, we have fx is equal to fa plus x minus a divided by 1 factorial times f dash a plus x minus a square by 2 factorial f double dash a plus so on till x minus a whole to the power m minus 1 divided by m minus 1 factorial multiplied with the m minus 1th derivative of the function f at a plus an arrow term given by x minus a whole to the power m divided by m factorial mth derivative of f at a point in between a and a which can be expressed by a plus theta times x minus a for some theta in between open 0 to open 1. Here in the statement by the phrase m times continuously differentiable, we mean the function f has derivatives of all orders till the mth order at any point inside this closed and bounded interval a to b and all these derivative functions are continuous inside the concerned interval. Now here as we have assumed the mth order derivative of the function f continuous inside this interval a to b, we can write this expression by the value of the function at a plus some error function epsilon of x minus a where epsilon x minus a tends to 0 as x tends to a. Because then only by taking limit x tends to a on the left hand side, we will get on the right only the term, the function's value at a. By using this observation, we can write from this equation that if x is equal to f a plus x minus a times f dash a plus x minus a square divided by 2 factorial times f double dash a plus so on till x minus a to the power m minus 1 divided by m minus 1 factorial f m minus 1 at a plus x minus a whole to the power m divided by m factorial. Now this portion we replace by this expression which then gives us this term plus x minus a whole to the power m divided by m factorial times the function epsilon of x minus a. Now we see that this term can be written as small o of modulus of 
x minus a whole to the power m around the point x equals to a because you have limit x tends to a this expression encircled over here divided by modulus of x minus a to the power m is equal to 0. So we can simply replace this term encircled over here by this term small o of modulus x minus a whole to the power m. In fact, we can use even big O notation here because any small O function is a big O function. So, for a function f that is m times continuously differentiable on a closed and bounded interval a to b, we can express the function f by all these terms from f a till this term together being added a small o of modulus of x minus a to the power m. If however, if we consider the function f is m plus 1 times continuously differentiable on the closed and bounded interval a to b, we can write the expression of the function fx in terms of all these terms those are over here together with a term big O of modulus x minus a to the power m plus 1 over here. We neatly write that statement that let f is m plus 1 many times continuously differentiable on the closed and bounded interval a to b then for any x inside open a to closed b we can write fx is equal to fa plus x minus a divided by 1 factorial f dash a plus t x minus a to the power m divided by m factorial multiplied with fma plus ending up with x minus a whole to the power m plus 1 divided by m plus 1 factorial times f m plus 1 at a plus some number theta dash in between 0 and 1 times x minus a. Now here you notice that as this function m plus 1th derivative of the function f is assumed to be continuous inside this closed and bounded interval a to b by the Weierstrass extreme value theorem for continuous function, this function has absolute value bounded by some constant, say capital K, then this entire expression, that is the last term on this equality, is of big O of modulus x minus a whole to the power m plus 1. So we can simply replace this last term over here by this term big O of modulus x minus a whole to the power m plus 1. So while using Taylor's polynomial approximation that is this expression for a function f that has m plus 1 times continuous differentiability then we need to add a term that is of big O of modulus x minus a whole to the power m plus 1 but when the function f is only m times continuously differentiable then we need to add a small o of modulus x minus a whole to the power m together with this polynomial approximation of the function fx. I must here mention where you can find proofs of this Taylor's theorem. To find a proof of this result 1, you may please visit the page number 345 on theorem 9.7.1 of the book by Professor S. K. Mapa in its 5th edition 2006. Now with the help of these two results, result 1 and result 2 on Taylor's approximation, we see that the function f can be approximated by a polynomial of 
degree at most m with an error of small o of modulus x minus a to the power m if the function f has continuously differentiable derivative till order m and if f has continuous derivative till order m plus 1 then f can be approximated by a polynomial of degree at most m with an error big O of modulus x minus a whole to the power m plus 1. You know this polynomial of degree at most m is called Taylor's polynomial approximation of the function f of order m. We write this nomenclature over here that for a function of one variable that has continuous derivatives up to order at least m, the function f a plus x minus a divided by 1 factorial f dash a plus so on till x minus a whole to the power m x minus a whole to the power m divided by m factorial f m a is referred as Taylor's polynomial of order m for the function f at the point a. This expression is also referred as Taylor's expansion of the function f of order m at the point a. You know in a course of optimization quite often we will require Taylor's linear approximation or Taylor's quadratic approximation of a function of one variable or of a function of several variables. In developing optimization algorithms we mostly use the derivatives of the concerned function only up to order 2 because computation of derivatives of higher order might be tricky or might be effortsome and we need to use the derivatives till at least of second order because the second order derivative of a function gives us the bending information or whether the function has a graph around a point that curves up or curves down and this bending information or the curvature information is very much important in developing optimization algorithm because without the second order derivative information we will not be able to identify ups and downs of the function and hence possibly we will not be able to guess where the function has optimum or at least stationary points. As here I have said that second order derivative of a function of one variable gives us the bending information of the graph of the function at a point. Let me give you a sense why second order derivative information gives us how the curve of the function bends at a point. Let's suppose in the xy plane the graph of a twice continuously differentiable function around the point x is equal to a is somewhat like this. We also consider a function that has second order derivative but around the point let's suppose a the function has graph of this kind. The first derivative of the function at the point a tells you whether the graph of the function is increasing or decreasing at the point A. If the derivative value is greater than 0, then we all know the function f is increasing. If the derivative value is less than 0, we all know the function f is decreasing. So, first derivative of a function tells you whether the graph of the function is increasing or decreasing. Then certainly the second derivative of a function will inform us whether the first derivative function is increasing or decreasing at the point. Now around the point A, we all know that the derivative, the first derivative of a function gives us the slope of the tangent at the constant point. So around the point A, if we look at the graph of the tangents, they are of these straight lines whose slopes immediately inform us that 
when we move from left to right of the point A, the slope of these tangents is decreasing. That is, when we move from the left to the right of capital A, we have F dash value decreasing, which will actually reflect that the second order derivative at the point A is less than 0. So, when the second derivative of the function is less than 0, the graph of the function bends downward with respect to the tangent line at x is equal to a. Now we look at this particular graph over here and if we consider the tangents around the point a on the graph of the function, then we find that when we move from the left to the right of the point x equals to a, the slope of these tangents, that is the derivative value of the function f, is monotonically increasing, which is actually reflected by the derivative value of the function f dash at a is greater than 0. So, when the second order derivative at the point a is greater than 0, we see that with respect to the tangent, the tangent line the graph of the function bends upward. So, this second order derivative of a function of one variable gives us the information whether the curve or the graph of the function y is equal to fx bends up or bends down around the constant point x is equal to a. For functions of several variables, similarly, the positive definiteness or the negative definiteness of the Hessian matrix will inform us whether the surface of the function z equals to fx bends upward or bends downward. As the bending information of the graph of a function and the monotonic nature of the graph of a function, these two informations together monotonic nature and the bending information give us sufficient clue whether we are in the vicinity of local extrema. In optimization theory, we majorly use the first order and the second order Taylor's approximation to approximate a given function of one variable or a given function of several variables. As this Taylor's first order and second order approximations will be used throughout the course quite often, let me neatly write the equation of first order and second order quadratic approximations, Taylor's approximation for functions of one or several variables. For first order Taylor's approximation, for a function of one variable around a point, let's suppose A, if the function F has first order continuous derivative, by that we write F is a C1 function, then when X is in the vicinity of the point A, if X can be expressed by F A plus x minus a times f dash a plus as m is equal to 1 here we will end up with small o of modulus x minus a if however the function f is having continuous continuous derivatives up to second order by that we write f is a c2 function if x can be expressed by f a plus x minus a times f dash a plus as here we have m plus 1 is equal to 2 so m is equal to 1 we can end up with here big o of modulus x minus a to the power m plus 1. Similarly, for functions of several variables, the first order Taylor's approximations for the functions that are of c1, we will have if x is equal to if a plus this derivative will be replaced by 
gradient of the function at a its dot product with the vector x minus a plus small o of norm of x minus a if the function is of c2 then fx can be written as fa plus gradient fa transpose x minus a but as here we have f that is of c2 we will end up with big o of norm of x minus a square of it over here for the second order taylor's approximation we just write the equations for the functions of several variables by putting n is equal to 1 we will get the corresponding approximations for functions of only one variable if the function f is c2 then taylor's second order approximation of the function f around the point a is given by f a plus gradient of f a transpose x minus a plus 1 by 2 factorial x minus a transpose the hessian of the function f at a this matrix multiplied with x minus a plus small o of norm x minus a square of it if however the function f is c3 that means f has all partial derivatives up to order 3 and all of them are continuous then if x in terms of second order taylor's approximation can be written as f a plus gradient of f a transpose x minus a plus half x minus a transpose hessian at the point a times x minus a plus big o of norm x minus a cube of it by relooking at all these expressions of first order and second order taylor's approximation then we see that when we are ending up with this linear term then the error function is either small o of norm x minus a or in terms of big o this error function is big o of norm x minus a square notice that the expression inside this small o has power is equal to 1 when you are ending up with a linear term but if you are ending up with a quadratic term to approximate the function f then you notice that this power is equal to 2. So while ending up with a quadratic term as the Taylor's approximation we must write the error term in terms of small o with norm of x minus a square of it but if you are ending up with a linear term then the error term in terms of small o will involve simply norm x minus a to the power 1. But if you are writing out the error term in terms of big O notation, then we have to increase the power just by one unit. The power of this term which is equal to 1 plus 1 unit. So 1 plus 1 is equal to 2. Similarly here if you are ending up with a quadratic term, then in that case, in terms of big O, this error term involves norm of x minus a to the power 2 for the second order plus 1. So here we get norm of x minus a to the power 3. Now here you might wonder how these equations for approximating the function a are coming for functions of several variables. For functions of one variable, we have already described the Taylor's theorem. Now we will describe Taylor's theorem for functions of several variables from where you will be able to easily grasp how these equations of approximating functions of several variables are coming like this. 
I will describe here the Taylor's theorem for functions of two independent variables from where just by increasing number of variables in the function, we will get the Taylor's theorem for functions of three or more variables. The Taylor's theorem for functions of two independent variables states that let the function f of two variables x1 and x2 has continuous partial derivatives up to mth order in some neighborhood of the point say a1 a2 and a1 plus h1 and a2 plus h2 be any point in that neighborhood in which the function has continuous partial derivatives up to mth order, then there exists a constant theta in between 0 and 1 such that f of a1 plus h1 and a2 plus h2 is given by f a1 a2 plus 1 by 1 factorial h1 times the operator del del x1 plus h2 times del del x2 this operator being applied on the function f and evaluate it at the point a1 a2 plus 1 by 2 factorial h1 del del x1 plus h2 del del x2 square this operator being applied on f and evaluate at the point a1 a2 if continuing till 1 by m minus 1 factorial multiplied with this term plus the error term given by 1 by m factorial into this term where these operators these these and all these are given by their binomial expansion that is for instance let me just write out the complete expression of this operator say h1 del del x1 plus h2 del del x2 to the power let us consider some specific number let's suppose 3 here to be applied on the function f and evaluate this value at the point a1 a2 this operator is equal to if we expand this term binomially then we will get here that h1 cube of this operator del del x1 thrice so you apply del del x1 then employ it over del del x1 and afterwards one more del del x1 so this will give us the operator del q del x1 3 plus 3 choose 1 that is 3 times h1 square h2 into del del x1 twice so del 2 del x2 and then apply del del x2 so ultimately we will get it as del q del x1 del x1 del x2 plus 3 choose 2 which is equal to 3 times h1 into h2 square del del x1 over del del x2 twice so we will get here del q del x1 del x2 del x2 2 del x2 del x2 plus the last term h2 q del del x2 thrice so del q del x2 3 you employ this operator on the function f so we get here in the first term del q f del x1 3 in the second term here we will get del q f del x1 del x1 del x2 here we will have f here also f 
all these need to be computed at the point a1 a2 this is what this entire expression means now here had it been a function of n variables say f of x1 x2 x3 and so on till xn then we will have here in the left hand side of this expression in the argument we will have n many components a1 plus h1 then the second component is a2 plus h2 the nth component will be a n plus h n and on the right here we will have a1 a2 till a n but this expression with this operator and other terms with these operators will get revised by n many components that is given by inside this bracket h1 del del x1 plus h2 del del x2 till you have n many variables so ending up with h n del del x n here in the second term this operator will get revised by square of this term and so on a proof of this result for functions of two or more variables is very simple and that is given by the taylor's theorem for functions of one variable you notice that inside this expression given by this equation we actually wanted to write an expression of the function's value at the point a1 plus h1 and a2 plus h2 in terms of the function's value and the derivative value at the point a1 a2 to realize this expression in this equation what we do we construct a function of one variable that is given by the function of two variables fx1 x2 along this line segment notice that any point on this line segment can be presented by a1 plus th1 and with the second coordinate as a2 plus th2 for some value of t in between 0 and 1 notice that the given function f on this line segment reduces to this function which is a function of one variable let us denote it by some function let's say phi t where t lies in between closed 0 to closed 1 now here as the function f is assumed to be having continuous partial derivatives up to mth order up to mth order in some neighborhood of the point a1 a2 the function phi is having continuous partial derivatives up to mth order inside this interval closed 0 to 1 and hence by taylor's theorem for functions of one variable in the interval 0 to 1 we get that phi 1 is equal to phi 0 plus phi dash 0 plus phi double dash 0 divided by 2 factorial plus so on till phi m minus 1th derivative at 0 divided by m minus 1 factorial plus 1 by m factorial mth derivative of phi being calculated at some theta where theta is some real number in between 0 and 1 now with the help of the chain rule the derivative of this function phi can be computed as follows in fact this computation of derivative of the function phi was calculated in the previous lecture that phi dash t is given by del f del x1 then the derivative of this a1 plus t h1 with respect to t so we get here h1 being multiplied then in the next you will have h2 del f del x2 this entire expression to be calculated at a general point a1 plus h1 t a2 plus h2 t which in fact is then giving us that we are employing the operator h1 del del x1 plus h2 del del x2 on the function f being evaluated at the general point a1 plus h1 t a2 plus h2 t so as if when just you take once derivative of the function phi we are just employing this operator over the function f at a general point a1 plus h1 t a2 plus h2 t and hence if you take 
the second derivative phi double dash t will be then applying this operator twice on the function phi and in general if we go for computing the derivative of kth order for some k till the value m we need to employ this operator h1 del del x1 plus h2 del del x2 k times on the function a being evaluated at the point a1 plus h1 t a2 plus h2 t and hence this kth derivative of the function phi at t is equal to 0 will give us this entire operator being employed on the function f but to be evaluated at the point a1 a2 you will not have these two terms h1 t and h2 t when t is equal to 0 and that is exactly what we have written over here that this expression if a1 plus h1 if a2 plus h2 is given by this entire expression now considering the value of m is equal to 2 i will write this entire taylor's approximation of functions of two variables and then i will give you a home task to check out the second order taylor's approximation for functions of several variables that I have written down earlier in this lecture. You notice that if a function f is of C2, we are considering a function f of just two variables, then you notice that the Taylor's theorem for functions of two variables will give us f a1 plus h1 a2 plus h2 is equal to f a1 a2 plus h1 del f del x1 plus h2 del f del x2 to be computed at the point a1 a2 plus square of this operator which gives us h1 square del 2 f del x1 2 plus h1 h2 del 2 f del x1 del x2 plus h2 h1 del 2 f del x2 del x1 plus h2 square del 2 f del x2 2 to be evaluated at a1 plus theta h1 a2 plus theta h2 for some theta in between 0 and 1 and hence we can write out this entire term equals to f being evaluated at the point a1 a2 plus you notice that the second term can be written as gradient of the function f computed at a1 a2 transpose the vector h1 h2 plus this last term can be written as transpose of this vector h1 h2 so h1 h2 here then the hessian matrix f x1 x1 f x1 x2 f x2 x1 f x2 x2 to be evaluated at the point a1 plus theta h1 a2 plus theta h2 times this vector h1 h2. In general for a function of several variables this expression at the bottom of this line can be written as f of the point a, a has coordinates this a1 a2 a3 till a n plus the gradient of the function at the point a transpose the vector h having n many components h1 h2 h3 till hn plus h transpose the hessian matrix of the function f evaluated at the point a plus theta times h times the vector h and this expression is identical with the function's value at the point a plus h that is this entire expression is equal to 
a for a plus h. Now here I will end up by giving a home task that you please verify that from this expression that for a function of n variables that has continuous partial derivatives of two order two that means f is a c2 function with the help of this expression please verify that we have f of a plus h is equal to f a plus gradient of f at a transpose h plus half of h transpose hessian of f at the point a times h plus small o of norm h square or in terms of the variable vector x, f of x is given by f of a plus gradient of a, a transpose times x minus a plus half x minus a transpose, the Hessian matrix of the function f at a times x minus a plus small o of norm x minus a square of it. With this I end up this lecture here but before that let me mention you that this expression f of a plus h is equal to this entire expression is referred as second order mean value theorem for functions of several variables. In fact if we end up with the first term that if we write here f of a plus h only with f a plus ending at first order term we will have here grad f to be evaluated at a plus some theta dash times h transpose h where theta dash is some number in between 0 and 1. This equation is referred as mean value theorem of first order for functions of several variables. You notice that this equation reduces to our well-known Lagrange's mean value theorem for functions of one variable. If we have the function f, a function of one variable, then you see that we have f of a plus h is equal to f a plus this gradient will be replaced by the derivative of the function f at the point a plus theta dash h into h, which is the well-known equation in the Lagrange's mean value theorem for function of one variable. So this equation is referred as mean value theorem or first order mean value theorem for functions of several variables. This equation is referred as second order mean value theorem for functions of several variables. With this comment, let me stop this lecture here and you know all this Taylor's theorem is named after an English mathematician, Brooke Taylor, who lived in this earth only 46 years and produced one of the most widely used equations of mathematics, this Taylor's polynomial approximation. Thank you. Thank you all for all of your kind attention.